JavaScript is the most popular programming language in the world. It can run on any type of device and has such a low barrier to entry that even your grandparents can be web devs these days. In all seriousness, despite being famously created in just 10 days and having way more, for lack of a better word, interesting parts than good parts, JavaScript is pretty much the undisputed champion of the dev world. Because of its popularity, a wide variety of frameworks, utility libraries and related programming languages emerged. They are doing a great job improving the dev experience and, these days, it is easy to forget that browsers are still running just plain old JavaScript under the hood. In this video, we'll get back to the basics and we'll look at more than 20 vanilla JavaScript concepts every developer should be familiar with. Without further ado, let's jump right into it. We'll start with some basics and then work our way up to some more advanced async topics and functional programming concepts. Expressions are JavaScript code snippets that result in some sort of value. So the hello string produces hello, one is greater than two produces false, and this array pop produces the one value. Expressions can be as long or as complex as needed, they can contain other expressions, and they don't necessarily change state. So, in the 1 plus 2 bit, we actually have the sum as an expression, 1 as a separate expression, and 2 as another expression. To reiterate, anything that results in some sort of value is an expression. Statements are the building blocks of any JavaScript program. Basically, each statement tells the computer to do something, so this would tell our computer to assign the value 5 to the x variable, while this tells it to throw an exception. Equality versus strict equality is probably the most common question in interviews for entry-level positions. In order to test for equality, you can use two equal signs or three equal signs. The difference is pretty straightforward. While the double equal operator only compares values, the triple equal operator compares both value and type. So the number 10 is equal to the string 10, but they are not strictly equal. The triple equal is also known as the identity operator, but keep in mind that in other programming languages, identity implies that the compared values are references to the same object, meaning that both variables are pointing to the same space in the heap or the stack. As a best practice, try writing your code in a manner in which you should only be needing the strict equality operator. Var versus let versus const is probably the second most common question in JavaScript interviews. These are keywords allowing you to declare variables in your code. Let allows you to reassign the variable later, while const doesn't. Do not confuse const values with immutable values, since the property of a const object can still be reassigned. Var also allows you to declare variables, but your declarations will have the wrapping function as their scope. Scope determines the accessibility or visibility of variables. There are three types of scopes in a JavaScript program, global, function, and block. However, there is a fourth variation called lexical scope we'll look into as well. To outline this, let's take a quick look at the following situation. In a plain JavaScript file, we are defining a function called notify inactive users. Inside this function, the inactive users are assigned using a const and then the list is iterated. The for each construct accepts a function as an argument where we are simply sending the notification message. So let's see what the scopes are here. The link variable is defined as a const, so its scope is bound to the if block. The if block is defined in the for each function, and that's the function scope. Whenever the for each function is executed, it has access to its outer scope as well. This could be another function scope or the global scope. This outer environment is called the lexical scope, and you should keep this in mind because we'll get back to it in a few minutes when we'll discuss closures. Finally, if the file would be imported as is in a browser, the user's const and the notify inactive users functions would be declared in the global scope. The global scope is considered one of the JavaScript's many pain points, and it is advisable that you avoid polluting it with too many of your custom variables and functions. One easy way to keep the global namespace clean is to use immediately invoked function expressions, which are functions that run as soon as they are defined. Back to the code, think of the situation when the link variable would be defined using var. Then, its declaration would have been lifted outside the if block to the function level. I'm sorry, but we're still not done with all these declaration caveats. Hoisting is another interview favorite when it comes to JavaScript implementation details. The JavaScript interpreter splits the declaration and the assignment of functions and variables, and it hoists your declarations to the top of their containing scope before execution. This applies to all var, let, and const variables, but var values are also initialized with the undefined value. In such situations, our variables are in the temporal dead zone, which starts at the beginning of the variable in closing scope and ends when it is declared. Accessing the variable in the TDZ throws a reference error. 
And since we are discussing JavaScript head scratchers, here is another gem, the this keyword. You might be foolish enough to assume that the this keyword points to an associated object, just like in any other programming language. Well, you could not be further from the truth. In an object method, this references the object. Alone, this references the global scope. And in a function, this references the global object as long as you are not running in strict mode. In the strict mode case, this is undefined. Since the this keyword can point to different entities when inside a function, you can use the call and apply methods to enforce specific function contexts, or use the bind method to get a new function definition correctly bound to a specific object. The context of this is why you saw a lot of bindings when defining event handlers, and this is also the reason arrow functions were introduced in the language. Fun stuff, right? Well, it's not all that bad. One of my favorite features of the language is the support for object literals. This is a very flexible and efficient way to declare data structures using a list of key value pairs separated by commas and placed inside curly braces. As a best practice, try sticking to strings as keys and values can be anything from primitive values to functions or other objects. Of course, objects can also be created using the new keyword and the constructor function, which leads us to another particularity of JavaScript, the prototype chain. Each JS object has a private property which holds a link to another object called its prototype. Via this relationship, objects inherit state and behavior from their parent prototypes. Every prototype object has a prototype of its own, and so on, until an object is reached with null as its prototype. By definition, null has no prototype and acts as the final link in the prototype chain. Because it is possible to mutate any member of the prototype chain or even swap out the prototype at runtime, this architecture is considered a JavaScript weakness. However, the prototype inheritance model is more powerful and flexible than the classical one. Therefore, even though better class support was added in the language over the years, this support is still built on top of prototypes. I mentioned classes, which were introduced in ES6 in an attempt to bring JavaScript closer to what the community expected from a modern programming language. So, before ES6, you had only the new operator and plain functions acting as constructors as options for object-oriented programming. Encapsulation was possible by employing various function scoping strategies, and inheritance was very obviously linked to prototypes. Now, you can have access to keywords such as class or extends, you can define proper constructors, getters, setters, and private fields. On top of that, we gain access to the proxy and the reflect API, which allow us to intercept object operations, understand or alter their structure. This could be extremely powerful, and you can check out the video linked in the top right corner if you want to find out more details on this topic. So, while the language popularity increased, we started to see more helpful features and constructs added in the language. Template literals are such an example. For a long time, JavaScript only allowed string declarations using the double and the single quotes, and the overall dev experience looks something like this. With template literals, we can refactor this code, use backticks instead of quotes, add in interpolation using the dollar sign notation, and leverage new line support for an overall better result. Next, let's take a quick detour and discuss the async capabilities of JavaScript. Most of the time, when you are working in the browser, you are describing and developing for various events that might happen in the future. Think here of listening to the browser events, accessing device features, or receiving server responses. The most basic solution for such scenarios is to use callbacks, but when apps grow in size and the server-client communication becomes more complex, promises are a better solution. The promise object represents the eventual completion or failure of an async operation and its resulting value. The promise API is straightforward and pretty self-explanatory. It's important to know that these objects can be changed and there are various utility functions such as promise all or promise any you can leverage to control the data flow. Most of the time, a good solution will not perform well in all scenarios, and this is the case with promises and nested callbacks. For the situations where a promise execution depends on the response from a previous promise execution, we can refactor the code and use the async await to remove some of the clutter from our code base. There is one small issue I want to clarify here. Reading the documentation, using await pauses the execution of its surrounding async function until the promise is settled. If you don't spend too much time analyzing this, you might think, just like I did, that using a sync await will turn your code synchronous and the execution of your app will be blocked until the promise is resolved. This is not at all the case. A sync await is just syntactic sugar and the underlying implementation is still fully asynchronous. 
Finally, before moving forward to some functional programming topics, let's briefly look at generators. These are special objects you can obtain by calling a function star declaration and which, in short, provide a different way to make iterators. We can use the yield keyword to yield execution control back to the calling function, and then we can resume execution by calling the next function again. Functional programming is one of the most appealing parts of JavaScript, at least for someone like me, who transitioned to JavaScript from a strict object-oriented language with few functional capabilities. I note that there are a lot of debates about a better programming approach, but in my experience, in real projects, you'll end up using both. So a language that offers you the option to follow basic OOP principles while also providing various functional constructs and syntactic sugar is going to be more appealing to developers. So let's discuss functions. First, however, I'd like to take a moment and remind you to subscribe to this channel if you want to stay up to date with various topics from the dev world. JavaScript supports first-class functions, which is a fancy way of saying that there are no restrictions on their use and functions can appear anywhere in a JavaScript program. So you can assign a function statement to a value, you can pass it as a parameter to another function, or you can have it defined as a return type. Functions that work with other functions, either by receiving or returning them, are called higher order functions. This flexibility gives you access to a lot of different expressive ways to write your code. You can, for instance, compose the add and square functions into a resulting function, or if you are feeling fancy and you want to impress your colleagues, you can use currying. This is a more advanced technique that transforms a function from callable of sum x, y into a callable of sum of x and of y. Currying doesn't call a function, it just transforms it. Closures are a concept closer to the reality of everyday projects, and the chances are you are using them without actually realizing it. They are a combination of a function bundled together with references to its surrounding state. In other words, a closure gives you access to an outer function scope from an inner function. As always, this only scratches the surface of all the things you should know about JavaScript, even before considering looking at TypeScript and the UI library on top of all these. We didn't get the chance to discuss more advanced topics such as the event loop, modules, or the JavaScript's just-in-time compiler, but if these sound interesting, please let me know in the comments, and I'll work on a second video covering more JS concepts. If you've made it this far, congrats! You are now one of the select few who can help me fight the YouTube algorithm by liking this video. Until next time, thank you for watching.